children are so innocent, they don't know about adults molesting them. Their world to them is safe until somebody shows them differently. And then someone comes along and steals their innocence. Mine was stolen in the home. But now, on the streets, they're not safe. It was probably in 1943 or so. I didn't know who he was. All I knew was that my dad was very excited about taking me there for an interview. You ask, what would the American public say if they actually understood the background to what became the sexual revolution, a sexual psychopath? Do you ever remember your father molesting you with a stopwatch? Yes. If the American public knew that Kinsey worked with a Nazi pedophile and encouraged his rapes of children and possibly even in eventually the murder of this one little girl. You and I are going to be doing some experiments. This man was the singularly most important individual in the decriminalization of every single law that we had ever had that protected women and children. When America was founded, it said that our values were based on the Judeo-Christian teachings of the Bible. Andrew Jackson once said, that book is the rock on which our republic rests. But through the 20th century, the view of America as a Christian nation has been hotly debated. Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. This nation was founded primarily on Christian principles. Which claim should Americans believe? And by what standard do we determine the moral compass for what is right and wrong in our society? George Washington, in his inaugural address of 1789, said, the propitious smiles of heaven cannot be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. Among our once traditional values was the protection of women and children, once considered a sacred duty among all men. But now, under the guise of so-called liberty, the care of our most vulnerable has been compromised. We can only wonder what the father of our country might say if he could see what is happening to the children of America today and the reasons behind it. Many of America's children are disappearing. According to the Office of Juvenile Justice, a child goes missing every 40 seconds in the United States. While many of these children are recovered, it is estimated that more than 58,000 of them are abducted by non-family members each year. Parents are continually in fear for their child's safety, even in front of their own home. Predators seem to roam the streets of America like never before, searching for prey to carry out their unthinkable desires. 
Many of our laws are named after raped and murdered children, whose memories echo through our courts crying for justice. But still, the problem only seems to get worse. And we also see in a lot of these kidnapping and death cases recently by sex offenders that your child can be lost in just an instant. The faces of children who have been lost continue to haunt us as a society, while watching their parents grieve has become part of a national nightmare. Meanwhile, the images of the sex offenders, the men responsible for these horrors, fills us with fear and loathing. And if a child survives their abuse, they often lead troubled lives, haunted by the memory of what they've endured. It is awful. Those kids shouldn't be subjected to this. That's awful. It scars them psychologically forever. It affects their lives. Well, some of the experts say that once a pedophile, always a pedophile, that recidivism is 80 or 90 percent, if not more. The United States of America has basically become a pedophile's playground. Uh, Jessica Lensford's father, he had said, uh, he said, you know, wake up, America. Your child could be next. And sadly, a lot of people want to turn away from the evidence. They want to turn their heads like the proverbial ostrich with its head in the sand because they don't want to face what's going on until they're forced to face it because it becomes their child. Part of the confusion is over why many of our judges send repeat sex offenders back into our neighborhoods, knowing it is simply a matter of time before they strike again. Can the reason be that these same judges are compromised by their own sexual addiction? We know that the judges are like, they're human. They're like everybody else. Cases of judges who are compromised by porn are documented across the country. But the license for such behavior may have been issued in 1970 when Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas and retired Justice Arthur Goldberg wrote articles for Playboy magazine. But why would an association with a soft porn magazine like Playboy be cause for concern? And how could it pertain to the world of pedophiles? The disturbing answer to this question, as our history of this movement unfolds. In 1990, the American Bar Association reported that 80% of convicted child molesters plea bargain and serve no prison time. This statistic undoubtedly put known pedophiles back on the streets in record numbers. But this was a few years prior to the widespread use of the internet, where the most extreme forms of sexual perversion, and especially child pornography, have become a major factor in conditioning the next generation of sexual predators. In 2006, the law firm of Este and Bomberger reported that the number of victims of childhood sexual abuse and molestation grows each year. This horrific crime is directly tied to the growth of pornography on the Internet. They went on to say that research reveals that 77% of child molesters of boys and 87% of child molesters of girls admitted imitating the sexual behavior they had seen in pornography they had watched. Basically, people that watch porn act it out. And so with the pedophilia, um, sure, people are going to see it and they're going to act it out. Uh, because of the huge impact that the porn industry has had, um, conservative estimates say service, the highest service revenue on the Internet, uh, over $3 billion a year in income just on Internet porn. Uh, and those are very conservative figures. I'm sure they're much higher with between 500 and 700 new sites coming on a day on the internet. The increase in child sexual abuse cannot be denied. We are massacring our children. It is a holocaust against our children. I've prosecuted murders, I've prosecuted child molesters. And I'll tell you, I get more up in the air when I was prosecuting about the child molester than the murder. I'm not condoning murder, it's not the right thing to do, but it's over. The person's gone sad. But that poor little boy or girl, they're messed up for life. I mean, they're going to be carrying that baggage forever. And we as a society better start addressing that. Researchers argue that America's current problem with sexual predators is the fallout from the sexual revolution, a movement said to be inspired by the late Alfred Kinsey and his famous Kinsey Reports, first published in 1948. According to the conservative organization Human Events, the Kinsey Report is listed among the top 10 most harmful books of the 19th and 20th centuries. Number one on their list 
was the Communist Manifesto that inspired the deaths of more than a hundred million people in the 20th century alone. Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf that helped to bring about the Holocaust was listed at number two. While the quotations from Chairman Mao, who founded Communist China, was number three. At number four, as the first American title on the list, was the Kinsey Reports. Sexual behavior in the human male, followed by sexual behavior in the human female, which, when first released, was likened to dropping an atom bomb on American society. In 1989, a report from the National Research Council published a statement that American society can be divided into two categories, the pre-Kinsey and post-Kinsey eras. How could one man's influence come to define our culture and produce what some consider the most harmful book in American history? It would find its way into every aspect of our decision-making in our lives. Dr. Judith Reisman is renowned for her expertise on the damaging influence of pornography. She has testified repeatedly before the U.S. Congress. Her research has been used by the FBI and by governments throughout the Western world when determining their policies on obscenity. She is author of the book, Kinsey, Crimes and Consequences, in which she details the devastating impact of Alfred Kinsey in America an influence she believes is behind the growing number of sexual predators who seem to come from all walks of life. Teachers, doctors, lawyers, judges, uh, people are being caught right and left, uh, sacrificing their lives and their families' lives to their addictions to child pornography. How do you think it happened? It did not start today. It started back, back with Kinsey and who then kicked off what has become today's, uh, today's horror show. Child sexual abuse, rape, torture. People say, well, you can't track that all to Kinsey. Well, you can track enough of it to make an awfully frightening case. While Dr. Reisman's view may seem extreme, her evidence is disturbing, the results of which are so often reported in our nightly news. 35-year-old convicted sex offender Bradley Meinhardt was sentenced to just one to three years in prison for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl in East Penn and a guy at a prior. Here's the suspect right here, Joseph Edward Duncan. He has a long history of sexual aggression. Here's Larry Don McQuaid, the 41-year-old former school bus driver who's confessed to sexually abusing more than 200 children. I was able to manipulate parents and children alike that I was such a nice guy that I wouldn't do something as wrong and disgusting and uh, is that I consider myself a demon. It's too dangerous for me to be on the street. I'm Should he be released? Uh, we tried to protest parole. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, the statute requires his release. I didn't know that the average sex offender uh, predator uh, molests 100 children. I mean, that just makes my outrage even more. For years, Americans have wondered why repeat sex offenders so often receive light prison sentences only to be released back into society. According to Dr. Reisman, the answer is Alfred Kinsey. The laws were changed based upon his fraudulent data, and he was directly involved in those changes. Kinsey went state by state. I have his testimony in California in 1949 telling a committee that was about to toughen the sex laws and, and toughen up about the laws to protect children because there had been a murder of two little girls. He goes to California to testify in 1949 that you should release everybody, that, that pedophiles and pederasts did not repeat their crimes, that parole was absolutely critical. That would reduce our sex crimes. The committee believes him. They reduce all of our sex crimes. They parole people, and they haven't stopped. When the Kinsey Report was first released, the famous ACLU lawyer, Morris Ernst, wrote that virtually every page of the Kinsey Report touches on the legal code. He told the legal profession that no bar association, law school journal, or lawyer's committee can consider sex laws without the Kinsey study. According to Westlaw, the most widely used legal database, between the years 1982 to 2000, there were approximately 650 citations to Alfred Kinsey.
the model penal code that was adopted uh, just after 1955 was based on Kinsey's research. This is a flow chart I put together to describe how the Kinsey research gutted American laws. Through the American Law Institute, ALI, the American Law Institute Model Penal Code, 1955, that was where protections were then removed for women and children from American law system. The U.S. justice system from 1948 to today, that's what this is about. After publishing his reports, Kinsey traveled the country, giving lectures at universities and testifying before lawmakers. He was received as the leading scientific expert in the world on human sexuality. In particular, he discussed laws concerning sex offenders and the education of children. So of children, he said, 100% or are orgasmic from birth. Therefore, children can benefit from sex with adults and even incest, so that we, which is illegal, so we need to lower the age of consent. Uh, that's, he was working toward making everything legal, but that's all right. Children need early explicit sex school sex education since they're sexual from birth, which was illegal at the time, now it's everywhere. They need masturbation and hetero and homosexual acts to be taught to them, which was illegal, and now it's being taught. And about parole, Kinsey said that sex offenders rarely repeat sex crimes, therefore all sex offenders should be paroled, which is exactly what, then what started to take place. Part of Kinsey's defense of pedophiles was that children were not really harmed by sexual contact with adults. Therefore, it made no sense to incarcerate pedophiles for lengthy prison terms. In 1950, uh, Rockefeller funded the American Law Institute Model Penal Code. 1952, a Harvard Law Review called for a code to change our sex laws in accordance with what Kinsey had objectively found. And then in 1955, the code was created and sent out to all legislators in the country via these important people, judge, lawyers, sociologists, lawyers, and so forth. And from there, that went the ALI model, the, the sex offenses section, sent to states all over the country, adopted all or in part beginning in 1956 here and moving on to Illinois, to Minnesota and so forth, and all other states of the union. As Dr. Reisman noted, the model penal code was financed by the Rockefeller Foundation. Not coincidentally, the Rockefeller Foundation also financed the research of Alfred Kinsey. In the 1950s, a congressional committee was formed under Congressman B. Carroll Reese to investigate the influence of the large tax-exempt foundations, including Rockefeller. There was a huge concern at the time in the 1950s that the foundations were now being run by people with a strikingly strident a libertarian or liberal agenda which resisted and resented the Judeo-Christian way of life. The late Norman Dodd was the director of research for the Reese Committee. In an interview recorded shortly before his death, Dodd stated that part of what the committee had learned was that the objective of the great foundations was to remove America from the values on which she was built and to do so through the education system. What we had uncovered was the determination of these large endowed foundations, this Carnegie Endowment story and the Ford Foundation and the Guggenheim and the Rockefeller Foundation, all working in harmony toward the control of education in the United States. Dodd's testimony becomes an important issue when considering the direct impact of Kinsey's research on sex education in America. While the Reese Committee investigated many programs funded by the foundations, when it came to Kinsey's research, they were vehemently opposed by the late Congressman Wayne Hayes. Uh, that's established quite well in Renee Wormser's book on foundations, the power, their power and influence, a book that no American who wants to understand what happened to our country should be without. Renee Wormser was the lawyer for the Reese Committee. In his book, Wormser writes that the committee had dug up some significant material about foundation support of the Kinsey projects. This brought Mr. Hayes into a steaming rage, he says, and he asked to see our entire Kinsey file. It was produced for him, and he angrily declared to Mr. Dodd that we were to go no further with this particular investigation. 
contending that every member of Congress would be against our doing so. Mr. Hayes stated emphatically to Mr. Dodd that he would oppose any further appropriation to our committee unless the Kinsey investigation were dropped. Wormser writes that as a result, the valuable material in our Kinsey file never saw the light of day. What was it in the Kinsey file that provoked such a response from a U.S. congressman? As we move forward, consider that the Kinsey data was partly paid for by the American taxpayers, who continue to fund the Kinsey Institute to this day. There's more going on in that institute. They have covered up so much. Some believe that if Kinsey's research had been exposed in the 1950s, the information might have sparked a second American revolution. What was in the Kinsey file, and does that information continue to influence or even haunt America? Through the 1930s and 40s, Alfred Kinsey conducted thousands of interviews with both men and women, taking, as he called it, their sexual histories. The purpose of his study was to discover the sexual behavior of the average man and woman in America at the time. Kinsey was a professor at the University of Indiana in Bloomington. Despite his Christian upbringing, he would come to reject the Judeo-Christian belief of his family in favor of Darwinian philosophy, accepting the idea that man is simply a more highly evolved animal. Kinsey, as a zoologist and biologist, considered, rightly, that humans are animals, although lots of people hate to admit that. Kinsey's expertise had been the study of the gall wasp. He spent years collecting and cataloging thousands of them. Noticing the countless differences in these insects, he concluded that such variations must also be true of human behavior. Upon interviewing thousands of volunteer subjects, Kinsey not only recorded data, but drew certain conclusions about the sexual behavior of men, women, and children. But was his research that of an objective scientist or the intentional manipulation of a sexual deviant who wanted to remake the American male and female in his own image. Kinsey uh, has legitimized uh, the free sex revolution um, and he did it through academia. But what's interesting according to uh, research that's been done on this gentleman uh, this guy was a pervert himself. Kinsey's critics claim that his real motive was not science, but a social agenda to change the morality of America, something admitted by Kinsey biographer Jonathan Gaythorne Hardy. It's abundantly clear as you go into it that there was a very large social agenda. He, he didn't just want a greater tolerance and sanity from understanding the facts of sex. He, was, he thought it was quite monstrous the way homosexuals were regarded. In general, there was a very powerful social agenda, which is perfectly plain when you read the book from the polemic right the way through it, and was perfectly plain at the time to the people who worked with him. When the Kinsey reports were published, they shocked the country, because the behavior that Kinsey described did not at all represent what most Americans believed about their own sexuality. Consider that Kinsey was documenting the behavior of the World War II era, those that Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. Among Kinsey's more controversial claims is the idea that 10% of American men were fully homosexual for at least three years of their life, while 37% of American men had engaged in homosexual contact to the point of orgasm at least once in their lives. Later studies would place those numbers much lower, with only 1% of men in the U.S. claiming to be homosexual, while only 2-3% to admitted to some kind of homosexual activity in their lifetime. 
Nevertheless, Kinsey's data was seized upon by men like Harry Hay, who read the Kinsey reports, left his wife and children, and went on to found the gay rights revolution that began in the 1960s. To this day, the gay rights movement is largely based on Kinsey's data. Kinsey also reported high levels of premarital sex, claiming that 69% of American men had visited prostitutes and that 50% of married men were guilty of adultery. Again, a later study done as early as 1960 by Phyllis and Eberhard Kronhausen would find that the levels of sexual promiscuity among males were much lower than Kinsey had reported. According to his fellow researchers, the reason for this dramatic difference is because Kinsey manipulated the data, including men from America's prisons, as part of the regular male population. He wrote that he found 1,300 to 1,400 sex offenders that he used as his normal male population. What? In addition to the convicted sex offenders, Kinsey included regular prisoners who were serving time for other offenses, along with 199 sexual psychopaths, all mixed together as part of the regular male population and presented to the American people as the average American male. In this interview, for the documentary titled One in Ten, listen as Paul Gephardt, who was one of Kinsey's co-authors and a member of his original team, admits to the high percentage of prisoners and their impact on Kinsey's data. With these uh, poorer, lower educational level samples, and when I say poor, poorer, they had, for example, 55% were prison. 55% were prison. And uh, I think that has, a, you know, that has a definite effect. We, know, uh, we didn't have enough non-prison people to do much of a comparison, but he didn't do a comparison. He, he simply took the, uh, the prison people he got and used them at that, uh, you know, less than college educated sample. But the trouble was, by, you might say, emphasizing the less than college educated sample, he introduced a lot of errors into the data. With America's prison population presented as the average male, is it any wonder that laws would be changed to accommodate sexual predators while failing to protect women and children? To create high levels of homosexual activity, Kinsey also went into Chicago's underground, into gay bars and homosexual bathhouses, and incorporated the radically gay population into his regular male data. Along with bootleggers, gamblers, male prostitutes, ne'er-do-wells, pimps, thieves, and hold-up men, all this according to his own report. Kinsey used similar tactics to redefine the average American female. Uh, they use this picture all the time to try and show the American public that they were interviewing uh, average American women, all right? Except that this was their secretary, okay? This is a secretary at the Kinsey Institute, and they would always label her as though she was just some average American woman. Sometimes they put Kinsey in the picture interviewing her, and sometimes they put him. And now, after I expose that in one of my books, the Kinsey Institute has now admitted on its, on its website, you know, they, they give the name of her so it doesn't look as though they're trying to phony the thing. To create high levels of female promiscuity among American wives, Kinsey redefined married women to include any woman that had lived with a man for at least a year, a broad description that could include prostitutes who had lived with their pimps. In fact, prostitutes were a subculture that Kinsey specifically sought out, mixing them in with the regular female population. As a result, Kinsey's report stated that some 50% of American women engaged in premarital sex, while 26% of married women were supposedly involved in adultery. Kinsey went on to report that an incredible 87% of unmarried women were having abortions while 25% of married wives were also aborting. 
It was these high percentages, shocking even by today's standards, that would help to legalize abortion in the years that would follow. For decades, Dr. Judith Reisman has argued against what is often referred to as Kinsey's junk science because of its dramatic and devastating impact on American law and society. Corrections starts to enact all this into corrections decisions. In the legal profession in law schools, now Kinsey would be taught as part of the legal structure via the American Law Institute Model Penal Code, that ferrets out into the private and public education, becomes our sex education, is in our American Law Review journals, it's found in parole through corrections, state and local, and criminal, civil, family, and juvenile justice, and expert witnesses then from the sex world begin to inform this whole structure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have had a real dirty deal we have, as that FBI agent said to me, the head of, of, of the FBI Behavioral Science Unit, after he saw my work on Kinsey and on Playboy, he said to his sons, guys, we have been conned. Dr. Reisman is not alone in her conclusions, nor was she the first to discover these things. As Reese Committee lawyer Renee Wormser states in his book, the much-publicized Kinsey studies base an advocacy of criminal and social reform on the very unscientific material which Dr. Kinsey had collected. Wormser went on to cite psychiatric historian Albert Deutsch, who said of the Kinsey reports that, so startling are its revelations, so contrary to what civilized man has been taught, that they would be unbelievable but for the impressive weight of the scientific agencies backing the survey. Wormser comments saying, note how impressive is the word scientific and how false. But he goes on to suggest even more, revealing that, according to the Reese Committee, the postmodern thinking in America today is no mere accident, but has been intentionally created by the elite foundations as part of a greater agenda, one in which the work of Kinsey plays no small part. The Reese Committee wrote that it seems to this committee that there is a strong tendency on the part of many of the social scientists whose research is favored by the major foundations toward the concept that there are no absolutes, that everything, including basic moral law, is subject to change, however fundamental it may have been deemed to be under our Judeo-Christian moral system. The puerile doctrine that change is always necessary has led many of these scientists to believe that there are no longer any inalienable rights. They deem themselves justified with the support of foundation grants to label their prejudices as truth and to experiment with society. By far the most disturbing evidence against the Kinsey reports is the information pertaining to the sexual behavior of children. This was something noted in the 1950s by Professor Albert Hobbs, who wrote that, according to Kinsey, a child molester may have contributed favorably to a child's later sociosexual development. The child sexual data was more fully exposed by Dr. Judith Reisman in the 1980s, who brought the even more disturbing allegation that Kinsey had trained multiple pedophiles to molest children while using stopwatches to record so-called scientific data. This man, this Kinsey, had been responsible for the rapes and tortures of, of hundreds, actually it looks like thousands of children. Needless to say, the Kinsey Institute today denies Dr. Reisman's allegations. They maintain that all of the child sexual data came from one man, who just happened to keep detailed scientific records of his encounters with children. This lone pedophile theory was developed by Dr. John Bancroft, who became the director of the Kinsey Institute in 1995. 
Bancroft not only argued that the data came from just one man, but that Kinsey supposedly only got hold of the information years after this pedophile was finished raping kids. This is contrary to Kinsey's own report, in which he admitted to at least nine pedophiles from whom he obtained information. But in this 1995 interview on Canadian television, Dr. Bancroft says that Kinsey only referred to three or four pedophiles and then insists that, in reality, it was only one. When questioned about the obvious inconsistency, Bancroft's argument is that Kinsey simply lied about his research. Listen now as this Canadian journalist seems to get uncomfortable during the interview. Did he make it clear in the report that the conclusions uh, on the sexual capacity of 317 children were based solely on the evidence of one sexual criminal? No, he suggested that it may have been from three or four. I don't think that is a particularly important difference. Uh, Kinsey... Uh, but isn't that c conspicuously misleading? Uh, I think he, he was... Uh, Misleading. I think that uh, he. I'm had sorry, a you don't think he was misleading? Forgive me? Yes, I think he was yes. misleading, but I don't think it was a, a, a misleading of any consequence. He was concerned about his maintaining confidentiality. Uh, throughout his volumes, he tended to avoid drawing attention to any particular individuals. It's not significant that the conclusions of a study on uh, the sexual responses of children come solely from uh, a, a man who really has a. Who, who's a deviant? Doesn't he have a skewed perception of child sexuality? Well, that was just one type of evidence. Next, the journalist asks why it took so long to discover that the information came from a single pedophile, rather than multiple pedophiles, as Kinsey had reported. Bancroft's only answer is to say that he worked it out once he became the Kinsey Institute director. Why did it take so long to, to set the record straight? When I got to the Kinsey Institute and these accusations were continuing, uh, some people were expressing, some otherwise reasonable people were beginning to worry about these accusations and saying, well, uh, how is it that uh, if he's got information from three or four men, he can uh, standardize it in such a way that it goes into a table uh, unless somehow or other he's trained th these men to make these observations. People were beginning to express that concern, therefore I decided to look more closely at the source of information, and that's when I uh, uh, realized that actually, as far as those tables were concerned, uh, the information all came uh, from this one man who had been collecting this information in an extraordinarily methodical way throughout his life since about 1917. And you knew, you knew of this for how long? That it was, that, he, that uh, Kinsey was misleading in this? Uh, I, I worked out that there was one man involved uh, soon after I came to the Kinsey Institute and shortly after that we issued a press statement uh, from uh, Indiana University making this point clear. So, I'm sorry. That was at the beginning of September. Uh -huh. what, what the criticism is also, and it's, pro and it's significant, is, is that Alfred Kinsey was guilty of academic dishonesty and if the Institute wasn't wouldn't, if the Institute would have been for, more forthright, the people from the political and religious right wouldn't have the kind of ammunition that they, are, that they now have to try to not only discredit Kinsey, but, uh, but the teaching of sexual, sex education in schools. There is no reason to say that Kinsey has been uh, dishonest. He probably had a good reason for obscuring uh, whether it was one or three men. That is a minor detail. The minor detail of Kinsey's data may have had a major impact on America's children, especially when one considers that now, decades later, one in four teenage girls are currently infected with some kind of sexually transmitted disease. And according to the White House Office of National AIDS Policy, in the U.S., it is estimated that two young people aged 13 to 25 are infected with HIV each hour. Is this the devastating fruit of Kinsey's sexual revolution? Furthermore, should Americans trust information about child sexuality from child molesters who were raping kids? As Dr. Bancroft has admitted, Kinsey's pedophile data directly impacts sex education in America. The specific findings about these children are totally irrelevant to modern sex education. But where did Kinsey get his information? Did it really come from just one man? 
The allegedly lone pedophile that Bancroft and the Kinsey Institute point to was known as Mr. Green in Kinsey's research. His real name was Rex King, a man who kept written diaries in which he claimed to have molested more than 800 children. Like most pedophiles, King was never caught and never served a day in prison. The Kinsey Institute usually presents King as a man who simply kept meticulous records and mysteriously came into contact with Kinsey. This same idea was presented in the Hollywood film Kinsey starring Liam Neeson. But what Kinsey supporters do not reveal is that Mr. Green had been personally trained by Kinsey's mentor, Dr. Robert Dickinson. Something admitted by Paul Gephardt in the 1998 British documentary, Kinsey's Pedophiles. Kinsey was told about Green by his own mentor in sex research, Dr. Robert Dickinson. Dickinson had collaborated with the pedophile for several years and taught him how to record his child abuse in scientific detail. He told him how to measure things and time things and, uh, and encouraged him to... Uh, he knew he was going to do his uh, ordinary behavior anyway. Dickinson couldn't have stopped him from being a pedophile. Or, but he said, at least you ought to, uh, you know, do something scientific about it so there'll be, it won't be just your jollies, it'll be something worthwhile to science. So he gave him some training by uh, letter and correspondence. Gephardt has also admitted that Mr. Green's child abuse data played an important role in the Kinsey Report's view of child sexuality. Gephardt said, Green contributed a fair amount to our knowledge and medicine's knowledge of sexuality in children. We made our point that children are sexual from birth. But the sexuality of these children was determined because according to Kinsey's interpretation, the children supposedly enjoyed the molestation while it occurred. If we're talking here about science, you do not ask a rapist if his rape victim enjoyed the rape and then translate that to the American public as science. Well, nobody minds being raped. They all enjoy it. We ask these experts and the experts have told us the experts were the rapists. Dr. Clarence Tripp, one of Kinsey's original team members, offered this comment on Green's molestation of children. Well, here's this man with hundreds of contacts. There was never a charge against him. He was never arrested for anything. All the children thought he was wonderful. Uh, all the mothers thought he was wonderful. Uh, there are two, I suppose, lest uh, you get contradicted, there are two instances in which a young boy or girl, a girl, I guess it was, I don't remember, um, didn't complain, they agreed to the sexual contact, but then they found it very painful and yelled out when it actually took place. This was because they were very young and had small genitalia, and Green was a grown man with enormous genitalia, and there was a fit problem. The idea that the children enjoyed being molested by Mr. Green is shocking enough, but the suggestion becomes even more appalling with a testimony of Jonathan Gaythorne Hardy, a Kinsey biographer, who is one of the few people who have been allowed to view Kinsey's private records. Speaking about their practice of keeping files secret, Hardy said, the Kinsey Institute is nervous people will read the journals. Rex King described having sex with this little girl, this little boy. I think the Kinsey Institute felt right-wing figures would pluck out things I think they are right to keep them undercover. There are descriptions of King buggering boys nigh on 13 who doesn't enjoy it. I mean, it's quite sort of harsh stuff, some of it. But the most disturbing evidence comes from Kinsey's so-called scientific tables, wherein he describes the sexual responses of young children. When I was reading Kinsey's book in the first place, and I looked at the tables, Table 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. And these were tables with ages of children on the left-hand side. And then orgasm in one 
panel and timed orgasm, time of orgasm in the next one. In Kinsey's tables 31 through 34, he documented the timed orgasms of children as young as two months old, recording their responses down to the tenth of a second. The findings are so extreme that one child, a four-year-old, is said to have had 26 orgasms within a 24-hour period. For Dr. Reisman, the obvious question was, where did Kinsey get such information? And I, I, I looked at those charts and graphs. I can't tell you how long it took me to try to process what I was seeing. I said, These are, this is the torture of children. At the base of Table 31, Kinsey tells us that the data is based on actual observation of 317 males. Then on page 177 of the male volume, Kinsey writes, orgasm is in our records for a female babe of four months. But how would anyone recognize such a response in a young child? Kinsey wrote that among pre-adolescent boys and among younger females, orgasm is not so readily recognized, partly because of the lack of ejaculate. And so I said, what, what did this man, this Kinsey, call an, or, call an orgasm? Right. I mean, it's an obvious question, isn't it? I mean, um, First of all, this was not possible, but second of all, what did he call? Well, I saw he documented it on page 160 and 161 in, in Kinsey's book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. He described specifically what he called an orgasm amongst these children. Kinsey defined orgasm for pre-adolescent children with the following description. A gradual and sometimes prolonged buildup to orgasm which involves still more violent convulsions of the whole body. Heavy breathing, groaning, sobbing, or more violent cries, sometimes with an abundance of tears, especially among younger children. And he said there were six kinds of, six categories. He called them six categories of orgasm. And he had one, category one, two, three, four, five, and six. And included in these categories of what he called an orgasm, were uh, screaming, writhing in pain, hysterics, especially among younger children. He put that in parenthesis, especially among younger children, parenthesis. Um, he said that the children had convulsions. Those were his words. He said they fainted. He said they, they struck the partner. He called it the partner. This is the man who's raping the child. Okay. They struck the partner and tried to get away. And, and he said that those were all examples for him, for him, of orgasm. Kinsey made it clear that this data was supplied by adult observers who were defined as pedophiles by Kinsey's own team members, as you will hear later on. Kinsey wrote, some males suffer excruciating pain and may scream. The males in the present group, by which he meant pre-adolescent boys, become similarly hypersensitive before the arrival of actual orgasm, will fight away from the partner, and may make violent attempts to avoid climax, although, he said, they derive definite pleasure from the situation. Kinsey biographer James H. Jones was a 1998 Pulitzer Prize finalist for his biography on Kinsey. In the Yorkshire documentary, Jones had this to say about Kinsey's description of child orgasm. If you read those words, what he's talking about is kids who are screaming, kids who are protesting in every way they can the fact that their bodies, that their persons are being violated. At that point, reading that, I said, the only person who could write that would be, number one, a pedophile or a pederast, because these were boys, was homosexual abuse of boys and a sadomasochist. That is, the only human being in the world who could call an orgasm something that involved people throwing up, I mean, having convulsions, fainting, screaming, crying. Uh, the only person who could do that is someone who experienced that themselves. And that had to be a sadomasochist. And the only person who could apply their sadomasochism to an infant and a child would be a pederast, a rapist. And that's what Kinsey did in that book. 
Kinsey's own sadomasochistic tendencies have been documented by a number of biographers. James Jones revealed that Kinsey once climbed into a bathtub and circumcised himself with a pocket knife without the benefit of anesthesia. Another account of Kinsey's extreme self-abuse came about when his research was under investigation. Jones reports that after the Rockefeller Foundation withdrew his funding, Kinsey went to a basement, tied one end of a rope to an exposed ceiling pipe and the other end around his scrotum, then stood on a chair and jumped off. The abuse that he inflicted on his organs, on his sexual organs, were very directly identified in his death. That was orchitis. That was a serious inflammation and, and um, disease that he inflicted upon himself that was basically involved in his final death. Now, the attempt to claim that Kinsey died of a heart attack is a perfectly reasonable thing to try to do. It's kind of embarrassing to say that the father of the entire sexual revolution, who has trained all of our sex educators in the United States of America, basically, died because he had so abused himself doing the activity that they tell everybody is okay, that he died of this terrible and very painful experience. If Kinsey's abuse had only been inflicted upon himself, his critics might be less likely to accuse him. But his abuse extended to children, the most precious members of our society. In this image, Kinsey seems to take a demented sort of glee in showing these young children a film of two porcupines engaged in a sexual act. He seems oblivious to the confused and even disturbed looks on the faces of these children. Was it this same lack of concern that enabled Kinsey to support and even encourage the most depraved sexual criminals. The evidence shows that Kinsey was not content to work with merely one pedophile, as Dr. Bancroft and the Kinsey Institute claim. Following the example of his mentor, Dr. Robert Dickinson, Kinsey set out to train his own predators, men who would collect information about what can only be called the sexual torment of children. Dr. Clarence Tripp was Kinsey's photographer who filmed and photographed sex scenes in the attic of Kinsey's home in Bloomington, Indiana. In 1990, Tripp was interviewed on The Phil Donahue Show along with Dr. Judith Reisman, who appeared to defend her first book, Exposing Kinsey. Well, don't look now, but they're attacking Dr. Kinsey again. The book is titled Kinsey, Sex and Fraud, The Indoctrination of a People. During the show, as Clarence Tripp began to defend Kinsey's research, even Phil Donahue, with his liberal views on sexuality, became uneasy at some of Tripp's bizarre comments about the molestation of children. We should say that you are a, uh, the author of The Homosexual Matrix, a book which got quite a positive... Uh, Response yes, from. I want to agree with um, uh, Reisman on one point. Um, I think we really ought to talk about the child stuff before we mix in the. Right, we'll make your point. Sexual stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we really shouldn't go too fast there. We want to savor that because it is, it is wonderful. It's so delicious <laughs> what she says. I want to draw you a picture of the image. The image is that the world-famous sex researchers, or Dr. Kinsey alone, it's not quite clear, are in a room, and uh, they hover over a young child, less than a year old, and with their fingers or a feather, that's not quite sure, uh, clear, they uh, tickle the genitalia and bring this kid to orgasm, who is screaming that? and hollering and possibly <laughs> held down <laughs> by chains. <laughs> and drugged. It's all too... <laughs> Glorious. Well, make your point. I, I, you know, I hope that you don't. Uh, you're, are you, uh, you're well, being sarcastic? Make, but I want to uh, make. Sure. I didn't mean to be sarcastic. I didn't mean to be sarcastic. I'm more you're saying this is friendly. true that, that Dr. Kinsey or his colleagues if did not. This is this is the man who was with me on Donahue saying, "You got to stay with this. It's delicious what she says about what they were doing to to the children." Dr. Reisman refused to go on Donahue unless he would agree to show Kinsey's tables where the child sex abuse data is presented. Despite knowing about these tables, 
Donahue repeatedly insisted that no proof existed of child abuse in Kinsey's research. Nevertheless, he did show the data to his audience. Well, we're going to show. There. Now, uh, now, right, read now what is the point? You what is tell your me point? what is the point. <clears throat> Five months old. What is it? I can hardly read it. What's next Five to that? Five months old. Number of orgasms. Oh, number of orgasms. Three. Go down to the four-year-old. You see the four-year-old there? Yeah. There, bottom one. Yes, four-year-old, 26 orgasms in 24 hours. Tell, tell me, Phil. Tell me, yes, Phil. Does a baby sleep? Tell me, Phil. Tell me, Phil. Does a baby sleep? Tell me if this is scientific. A baby sleeps for eight hours. And you tell me how you get 26 orgasms for 24 hours. Well, 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 well. <laughs> We've got just to be minute. able to get a word in edgewise. Yeah. Just a minute, just a minute, yeah. just a minute. Sounds like a guest for the Donahue show. And you know, and you know what, and you know what Gebhardt said to me? You know what Dr. Gebhardt said? From, he wrote me a letter, which I wish you had up there too, in which he said that oral and manual techniques were used on the children. Now, Phil, I'm going to say that once my, more. My, my I'm going to say that once more. And if I'm wrong, let them sue me. He they said oral and manual <laughs> techniques were used on those children. Yeah. The letter that Dr. Reisman refers to was written by Paul Gephardt on March 11, 1981, in which he attempted to explain where the child sexual data came from. In this letter, he admits that multiple pedophiles were used in collecting information for the Kinsey reports. Gephardt writes, Since sexual experimentation with human infants and children is illegal, we have had to depend upon other sources. Some of these were parents. A few were nursery school owners or teachers. Others were homosexual males interested in older but still prepubertal children. One was a man who had numerous sexual contacts with male and female infants and children, and being of a scientific bent, kept detailed records of each encounter. Gephardt went on to say that some of these sources have added to their written or verbal reports photographs, and in a few instances, cinema. The techniques involved were self-masturbation by the child, child-child sex play, and adult-child contacts, chiefly manual or oral. Gephardt's letter clearly refutes the lone pedophile theory of Dr. John Bancroft, but fits in perfectly with what Kinsey documented in sexual behavior in the human male. Gephardt's mention that photographs and cinema were sent to Kinsey also explains the discovery made by former Kinsey Institute director June Reinisch in 1984. This was Newsweek uh, in 84 when June Reinisch said, you know, that the Institute encourages visitors and so forth. And she says, uh, uh, and um, what's her name, Reinisch, Reinisch says, that she found um, a collection of child pornography so distasteful to Reinish personally, she couldn't bear to look at it, all right? Now, nobody's, she's not asking where that child pornography came from, right? But some of it was... Now, she found this at the Kinsey At the Kinsey Institute? Institute, yes. Yeah, at the Kinsey Institute. And John Bancroft, who wrote about Kinsey and supported Kinsey for years before he was hired as the head of the Kinsey Institute, right? who was supposed to be an expert on Kinsey, which was why he was hired by the Kinsey Institute, now suddenly claims that everybody knew all along that these children were being raped by one pedophile. Well, he's the expert on Kinsey. Why didn't he ever write about it before he got hired? Why did he have to go into the Kinsey Institute to look into it, if it's all laying out there? He knew that, that it wasn't a couple of pedophiles which he said at one point, it wasn't one pedophile, which he said at another point. Kinsey said it was nine pedophiles. That's what he wrote. And it certainly would have been at least nine because we now know from Yorkshire Television that Kinsey was working with a group of pedophiles. There was also a pedophile organization in this country. Uh, they cooperated with us. And some of them who are not, of course, not incarcerated, uh, they came and uh, gave us information. Dr. Reisman believes the pedophile organization mentioned by Gephardt may have been the nucleus for what would become NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. While child molestation is a crime in any circumstance, the members of NAMBLA claim that their intentions are out of love for the children they molest. Yet this cover of a NAMBLA bulletin, which they called their back-to-school issue, 
paints quite a different picture. It shows a frightened boy cornered by two adult men who are about to force him into sexual contact and is more consistent with the information found in the Kinsey reports that children are in fact being raped and tormented by the pedophiles who prey upon them. To this day, Nambla looks to Alfred Kinsey as their inspiration, saying that gay liberationists in general, and boy lovers in particular, should know Kinsey's work and hold it dear. Implicit in Kinsey is the struggle we fight today. Well, there's a huge connection between Alfred Kinsey and Nambla. In fact, uh, Nambla has relied upon Kinsey's research for years. Kinsey uh, tried to make pedophilia seem acceptable. Kinsey's argument was that it was society's reaction to pedophiles that caused the real trauma of child molestation. Members of NAMBLA will often refer to this quote from Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, where Kinsey wrote that, When children are constantly warned by parents and teachers against contacts with adults, they are ready to become hysterical as soon as any older person approaches, or stops and speaks to them in the street, or fondles them. Some of the more experienced students of juvenile problems have come to believe that the emotional reactions of the parents, police officers, and other adults who discover that the child has had such a contact may disturb the child more seriously than the sexual contacts themselves. The current hysteria over sex offenders may very well have serious effects on the ability of many of these children to work out sexual adjustments some years later. In Kinsey's view, a lot of sex crime was really not crime at all. He seemed to worship sexual experience. I mean, he had a 24-7 obsession with sex long before he attained the position at Indiana University. So for him, uh, all forms of sexual experience, to one degree or another, could have merit that were outside the pale of traditional morality. Many researchers have come to believe that it was this philosophy that allowed Kinsey and his team to communicate with active child molesters and even train them to record their abuse in a scientific manner. While the Kinsey Institute continues to deny this, further evidence is found from the testimony of Dr. Clarence Tripp on The Phil Donahue Show. Listen carefully as Tripp confirms that there were multiple pedophiles, not just one, and says that they were trained observers that use stopwatches. I'm going to say that once more, and if I'm wrong, let them sue me. He they said oral it. and manual <laughs> techniques were used on those children. Yeah, how does, what American um, is going to defend that? How does C.A. Um, Tripp respond to that? Uh, she's talking about data that came from pedophiles, that um, he would listen to only pedophiles who were very careful, used stopwatches, knew how to record their things, did careful <laughs> surveys. And these she resents very much, but they're very important. So he, he interviewed people who were known criminals, <clears throat> I assume. Were they in prison at the time? Oh, certainly not. But uh, they were, in her sense, criminals because they were pedophiles. But they were trained Oh, in trained her sense, observers. they were criminals because they were pedophiles. They're they raping children observers. and they're not criminals. You're going to defend Nobody that. was raping children. Uh, what they what were do you doing... call sexually, manually, and orally abusing a baby, and you're a bloody pedophile? And, and we also have an interview that that was a, a phone interview that I have a copy of. Be it's in my book, between Gebhard and, and uh, Dr. Muir, who was my editor, in which Gebhard admits that they, they uh, told the pedophiles to use stopwatches. The interview Dr. Reisman refers to took place on November 2nd, 1992, between Dr. Gordon Muir and Paul Gebhard. Dr. Muir also appeared on The Donahue Show as the editor of the book, Kinsey, Sex, and Fraud. On the show, he confronted Clarence Tripp. Denying Are you that. telling me that, does, that Kinsey came across you, in an interview sample of 5,300 people he found pedophiles who had stopwatches, just happened to have this stopwatches, is, just happened to have all that data handy? Some two years later, in a phone interview, Dr. Muir would pursue a similar line of questioning with Paul Gephardt, one of the original co-authors of the Kinsey Reports, who succeeded Alfred Kinsey as the original director of the Kinsey Institute. Listen carefully how Gephardt admits that there were multiple pedophiles that he and Kinsey worked with, how they actually encouraged some of the adults to molest children, 
and that it was at the instruction of Kinsey and his team that they used stopwatches. Table 32. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the table's all right, but uh, that, these all were done with stopwatches necessarily. It says below table 32, the legend says duration of stimulation before climax. Observations timed with second hand or stopwatch. Well, second hand or stopwatch. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's, uh, you refreshed my memory. I had no idea that it was used on that many. Well, my question to you is this. Who did that? Who did the timing? Uh, it, it was dependent on who it was. Most of it was done by one individual, a man with some scientific training, but not a, not a known scientist. Uh, the other cases were done by parents at our suggestion. At this stage of the interview, Gephardt engages in a bit of wordplay, but listen carefully as Dr. Muir gets to the point with him. Once we ask people about giving us their observations, we would ask them later, too. In other words, if there were, if there were some pedophiles who reported their data to us, and, we could, and if they got in contact with us later, we would then ask know who these children are, how their right. parents were involved, and right. have we have we talked to those children right. now as adults? When I wrote to the Kinsey Institute and I asked 
What about these children? They just casually wrote me back. Gebhardt casually wrote me back that, well, we never had any follow-up on these children. It was too expensive, he said, or just impossible. What does he mean there's never been a follow-up? You just talked about men who are raping children, at least 317 children. Now we're looking at, it comes up to maybe 2,035 at minimum, probably, the youngest two months of age, and you call yourselves quote-unquote scientists and you've never even followed up. That's a lie. There's got to be some information, and if it was good information, if they had found out that these children were completely unharmed, lived fine lives, we would know about it. They would have passed that information on to us so fast. Many of the children abused by Kinsey's pedophiles probably had no idea that they were part of a government-sponsored study most likely living out their lives in suffering and confusion about what had happened to them. But when the Family Research Council released its documentary, The Children of Table 34, the haunting image of a stopwatch sparked the memory of a woman who calls herself Esther White. My grandfather uh, molested me when I was around four. And he never did again. But he went to Indiana University to get his teaching certificate. And he took biology while he was there. And um, so I'm assuming that he probably met Kinsey there because the whole university was involved in his research. As a child, Esther says she was taken by her father and grandfather to meet with Alfred Kinsey and to be interviewed by him. But the real purpose of that meeting would be a mystery for years to come. I didn't really um, know. I didn't connect at all until I read Judith Reisman's writings, especially when it came to uh, the video that she did uh, where they showed a stopwatch and that was the key I realized yes that was what was going on now in her 70s her desire is to remain as anonymous as possible out of consideration for her family Esther White is her assumed name how old were you when you met Dr. Alfred Kinsey it was probably in 1943 or so, 43 or 44. I was born in 34. Um, my father was very excited about taking me there to meet Dr. Kinsey. I didn't know who he was. All I knew was that my dad was very excited about taking me there for an interview. And he was instructing me that I was to um, be very nice to this man and answer him. Um, he told me he, they would ask me about my family and whether I loved my family and so forth. So um, when we got there, it was at my grandfather's and great-grandmother's house, and um, uh, Mr. Kinsey and his two colleagues were late in getting there because it was winter time and he was doing a seminar at um, Ohio State University this was in Columbus Ohio and um, when he came he was in very much of a rush because they were so late and he kneeled down in front of me and asked me questions about whether I loved my daddy uh, whether I loved uh, my family and um, of course I said yes because I did I loved my family and the interview was very short uh, there was a man with him that had a clipboard who was taking down my answers to the questions I can't remember all the questions he asked but it was probably a five or ten minute interview and um, just before they left, my grandfather said, what about the check? 
And uh, he says, oh, yes, I almost forgot. Who said that, Kinsey? Kinsey said that. And so my uh, grandfather took a check from him, and Kinsey said, I made it out to both of you because I didn't know which one was going to get the money. The disturbing implication is that Alfred Kinsey used taxpayer money via the Rockefeller Foundation to finance pedophiles who were actively molesting children. Why would he pay them? For what? At the time, I didn't know for what. Many years later, I found out that uh, my dad had actually helped Alfred Kinsey do research for his book. Esther's own father had been molesting her for years and sending information to the Kinsey Institute. When Kinsey's book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, was released, her father showed her a copy and boasted that he had helped to write it. At the time, she did not know what he meant. He gave me a copy of the book in 1947, but it was a pre-edition signed by somebody, autographed by somebody, and I don't remember who, but my father gave me the book and said that he helped Alfred Kinsey re you know, um, research uh, on the book and that it was going to change the way the world looked at sexuality. How old were you when your father first began to molest you? I was probably around six, maybe seven, I couldn't tell you exactly. Do you ever remember your father molesting you with a stopwatch? Yes. And then would he record information? There were um, uh, papers on the, on the dresser and I saw one of the papers one day and it had um, a lot of questions on it. Um, and there were little boxes to check those things off when those things were done. And uh, it was talking about orgasm. I didn't know what that word meant but at the time. And when I asked him what that word meant, when I saw it on the paper, he grabbed the paper, put it in a brown envelope, and he said that he was late in sending this in. And he put it in this big brown envelope. Esther's revealing testimony confirms Paul Gephardt's statement that Kinsey worked with parents who sent him child abuse data. She was also interviewed years ago by British filmmaker Tim Tate, who directed the documentary Kinsey's Pedophiles. Uh, Esther White, for what it's worth, um, swore uh, what's called a statutory declaration here. Um, she swore on oath that the information she gave was true and to the best of her recollection, and so did her mother. We asked Esther to give us her opinion about the Kinseyan philosophy that children are sexual from birth. Children are not sexual from birth. They are obedient to whomever is over them. In my case, it was my father. You honored your mother and your father. You obeyed what they said. You did what they said. That's the reason I was silent for so many years. I was told not to tell my mother that this was uh, normal and all the other little girls and boys were doing this too. So this was not a, a, a rare thing at all. That was They just didn't talk about it. So I was made to believe that I was sexual, but I wasn't. I hated it. I cried. I had convulsions. But that was totally ignored. She's heartbroken about the life that she lived because of her abuse at the hands of her father and grandfather who were working for Kinsey and sending material to him. Uh, there are others out there like that. Um, Bancroft said he knew there were and he was afraid they were going to show up. He wasn't talking about one pedophile when he said he was afraid that the children of these pedophiles would show up. He was talking about a lot of people who were damaged, and he knew it. 
and the Kinsey Institute knows it, and, the, and Indiana University knows it, and they've always known it. Kinsey would have done business with the devil if it helped the research, and this is true. I view Kinsey as one of the most treasonous Americans in human history. The charge of treason might sound a bit extreme, but the evidence shows that Kinsey's desire to document the most depraved sexual behavior led him to work with a man who seemed to personify evil itself, a Nazi pedophile named Dr. Fritz von Baljusek. Uh, Dr. von Baljusek was a, a Nazi officer, Gestapo, member of the Gestapo, one of the original Nazis, by the way, joined the party very early. Uh, he was in charge of a Polish town, uh, and he was a pedophile. Years after the war, von Baljusek was arrested and put on trial for the murder of a 10-year-old girl who had been found naked and throttled on a piece of wasteland. The German authorities suspected von Baljusek of the crime because the same girl had been listed among several hundred children he had raped, the details of which he had recorded in his pseudo-scientific diaries. The German newspapers called him the most important pedophile in the criminal history of Berlin. During the war, von Baljusek used his authority as a Nazi officer to fulfill his pedophile desires. The full number of children he abused and ultimately murdered is still unknown. When he was arrested, for, uh, po for rape of many, many, many children, but also possible murder of a little girl. All of the German newspapers spoke about this on the headlines. Of, it was in the headlines of every newspaper in Germany. During the war, von Baljusek was the commandant of the Polish town of Jędrzejów. There he threatened the children with certain death if they refused his sexual desires. What he recorded in his diaries of how he treated these children was so criminal that during his trial, the judge cried out, quote, this is no longer human. He had told the children that it was either the smokestacks or it was him. And uh, it turned out that most uh, all the children ended up by, apparently in the smokestacks anyway. Post-World War II, he was highly placed uh, in, uh, in, in civic government, and uh, he was arrested for this uh, possible murder um, and being investigated. And in the process, they found that he had been corresponding extensively with Kinsey, that Dr. Kinsey had warned him to be aware and careful of the uh, authorities so he shouldn't get caught. The German authorities learned that von Baljusek and Kinsey had a working relationship and that Dr. Kinsey was well aware of the vicious abuse the Nazi pedophile was inflicting upon innocent children. At his trial, the judge said to von Baljusek, I got the impression that you got to the children in order to impress Kinsey and to deliver him material. To which von Baljusek replied, Kinsey himself asked me for that. The German press was outraged and the, the judge was outraged. The judge went on to say, instead of answering his sordid letters, 
the strange American scholar should have rather made sure that Mr. von Balusek was put behind bars. The German press reported that Kinsey's letters to the Nazi contained warnings to watch out or be careful of getting caught. They wrote that in his diaries, von Balusek stuck in the letters from the sex researcher Kinsey, in which he'd been encouraged to continue his research. He had also started relationships to expand his researches. One shivers to think of the lengths he went to. At some point, the German authorities tried to get hold of information on von Balusek from the Kinsey Institute. The Kinsey Institute, even though they knew they were dealing with a Nazi and a pedophile, um, when the German authorities wanted, for the purposes of this uh, murder investigation, wanted to get hold of that information, um, the Kinsey Institute refused and Gebhardt said to me and indeed on camera that they would have destroyed any evidence before they handed it over to the police. Paul Gephardt said of this event that the FBI put pressure on Kinsey to reveal the guy's sexual diary. But Kinsey said, absolutely not. Gephardt went on to say, the poor pedophile had his reputation destroyed, finally quit corresponding with us. While German media documented the story heavily, the American press, under the powerful influence of the tax-exempt foundations, gave almost no attention to the story even though Kinsey's research, which had turned the country upside down, was almost certainly based in part on the sexual abuse done by a Nazi pedophile during the Second World War. It is entirely likely that von Balusek's letters to Kinsey can still be found in the records of the Kinsey Institute even today. Kinsey's willingness to work with the devil, at one point, seemed to take on a very literal meaning. One of the interesting things I found several years ago in researching the Satanist Aleister Crowley uh, was the influence that he has had on so many people here in the United States of America. And one of the man, men that he had influenced was Alfred Kinsey. After publishing his male and female reports, Kinsey began to travel abroad and study sexuality in foreign countries. In his book, Kinsey co-author Wardell Pomeroy wrote that Kinsey went looking for a prized item, the diaries of Aleister Crowley. Crowley died just a year before uh, Kinsey's book came out. Crowley was a famous and highly controversial British occultist in the early part of the 20th century. His sexual exploits in bizarre and sometimes deadly satanic rituals had been exposed in the London newspapers. He also talked about taking a virgin and having sexual relations with her and then upon a climax to actually murder her, cut her in six pieces and put the names of the various demon gods on those six limbs, those six parts of her body. Taking the name for the Antichrist in the Bible, Crowley called himself the Beast 666. His famous saying was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, by which he justified all forms of immorality. Crowley had a sex temple and had practiced uh, group sex and orgies and what have you, and so-called sex magic. Crowley was into pedophilia. He was into uh, justifying his pedophilia. In fact, he had said, let me seduce the boys of England. He wanted to seduce them, and he, then he starts talking about sodomy and it being, should be acceptable. So, uh, I mean, it was quite shocking, especially back then. Pomeroy wrote that Crowley was called by Lord Douglas the wickedest man who ever lived, 
and his sexual history alone was enough to earn him the title he gloried in, the Beast. Crowley kept a diary up to his death. Two weeks after Kinsey tracked down these papers in England, he found himself in the temple that the Beast had founded in Sicily. Kinsey is pictured here inside Crowley's temple, known as the Abbey Philema, where he performed his satanic rituals. On the wall is a picture of Crowley himself, while across from Kinsey is another man named Kenneth Anger. Anger was a close acquaintance who appeared in some of Kinsey's sex films, made in the attic of his Bloomington home. As an avant-garde filmmaker, Anger was deeply involved in the occult. He directed films with titles such as Lucifer Rising and The Invocation of My Demon Brother. Kenneth Anger uh, is a co-founder of uh, Anton LaVey's Church of Satan, and Kenneth Anger uh, also was, you know, had a penchant for younger men, for sure. Bobby Beausoleil was his living boyfriend. That's the same Bobby Beausoleil that committed the first m murder, uh, killing him and for uh, Charles Manson. That was his living boyfriend. He played Lucifer in one of his uh, occult uh, movies that extolled the virtues of Aleister Crowley's magic and what have you. In this image from one of Anger's films, we see Bobby Beausoleil, who would later become one of Charles Manson's killers. He's standing next to a doorway with Crowley's maxim, do what thou wilt, painted on the door. A phrase that certainly fit with Kinsey's own view of human sexuality. Pomeroy even admits that, that Kinsey uh, loved uh, Crowley's writings, including uh, specifically mentioning some of his homosexual erotica. Uh, uh, one of his books called White Stains. Kenneth Anger is quoted saying that Kinsey was obsessed with obtaining the Great Beast's day-to-day -day sex diaries. To obtain grant monies and maintain the support of the university, Kinsey needed the excuse of research to validate his 24 hours a day obsession with sex. However, Kinsey's battle cry of do your best and let other people react as they will seemed a variation on Crowley's do what thou wilt maxim. An older Kenneth Anger is pictured here with the name Lucifer tattooed on his chest. So important was Anger's relationship with Kinsey that to this day the Kinsey Institute Library features a Kenneth Anger collection with an archive of Anger's films as well as the correspondence between him and Alfred Kinsey. Should America be disturbed that the father of her sexual revolution, who changed American law and laid the foundation for sex education, had such associations? If America continues to be influenced by Kinsey, what will it mean for her future? What Kinsey discovered at Crowley's mysterious abbey might provide a clue. Pomeroy writes that Crowley's curious magnetism drew people from all over the world who came and became his sexual slaves. Some of these women left their husbands to enter the temple. They held group orgies as part of their ritual and included in them the small children the women had brought. He further reveals that inside the abbey, Kinsey found paintings, life-sized representations of sexual activity, including children. Some have considered the possibility that Aleister Crowley was another of Kinsey's pedophiles who kept his diaries as part of Kinsey's sex research. I would be surprised if Kinsey uh, was not, in fact, either paying or communicating with Crowley regarding his sex diaries because Crowley was more open and more public with his sexual exploits than pretty much anybody of the time. He was known as the wickedest man on the earth long before uh, Kinsey would have gone to him. He was far more uh, accessible than, say, a Nazi officer in Germany uh, to Kinsey. And, and as, as ugly as Crowley was to so many people, uh, he wasn't nearly as known or, or there wasn't the reputation that there was with the Nazis. 
and at the same time Crowley uh, could have used the money in the 1940s. He had, uh, you know, he wasn't as rich as he was. He had spent a lot of his money, so he would have been more open to that. And then to see that Kinsey was actually reading Crowley's stuff, we know that from Pomeroy. And it would be hard to believe that he wasn't already working with Crowley and encouraging Crowley to continue on with his sexual exploits. One way or another, the, the net effect is the same. Kinsey was fostering much of the same revolution that Crowley had begun over in England and was helping continue what Crowley hoped would take place in the United States of America. Mass media seems to have always been on the side of Kinsey and his philosophy. A philosophy carried out by Hugh Hefner in 1953 when he launched Playboy magazine. That same year, Kinsey released his K-Bomb, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, the second book in his report on human sexuality. Hefner made an immediate association between his soft porn magazine and Kinsey's research. I referred to it in the first introduction to the first issue and called it the other great book that was coming out in 1953. Max Lerner, uh, the historian and, and a good friend of mine, said that uh, Kinsey was the researcher and I was the pamphleteer. And uh, it's an interesting way of looking at it. I certainly do think that in a very real way the sexual revolution began in 1953, you know, with the second book and the beginning of Playboy. Hugh Hefner had been under the influence of Kinseyan philosophy since the release of the male volume in 1948. He had even written about it in a college publication years before he started Playboy magazine. Half a century later, in Playboy's 50th anniversary issue, Hefner paid special tribute to Alfred Kinsey, celebrating the man who had helped him launched the sexual revolution. But Playboy represented more than just nude photos of the girl next door. According to Hefner, the magazine was, quote, a statement of rebellion without question. The first official Playboy playmate was named Janet Pilgrim, directly intended to mock America's Puritan heritage. In time, Hefner would publish the Playboy philosophy, a new morality for the post-Kinsey era. Just as Kinsey had gone all over the country preaching the message of sexual reform, Hefner followed his example, giving speeches, appearing on talk shows, and speaking in public forums as the pamphleteer for Kinsey's sexual revolution. So what you're saying, Mr. Hefner, is that, is that we should encourage premarital sexual relations? I think that we should encourage the notion that uh, sex can be uh, right and proper in marriage or out of marriage. In time, Hefner set up the Playboy Foundation, which became, quote, one of the major sources of income for the Kinsey Institute. But was Hefner's sexual revolution simply about giving consenting adults the right to alternative lifestyles? Or was there a hidden agenda within the pages of Playboy, one that would further the child sexual abuse also found in the Kinsey reports? In 1983, Dr. Judith Reisman was appointed by the Juvenile Division of the Department of Justice to investigate the images in Playboy, along with Penthouse and Hustler magazines. The reason for the study was due to the rise of violent sex crimes committed by young adults against even younger children. Those who were committing these crimes were often found to have copies of Playboy and Penthouse magazines in their possession. But what could be in these magazines, often thought to be harmless, that would compel young teenage boys to commit violent sex crimes against other children? Dr. Reisman had done a radio interview with Pat Buchanan about her research into Kinsey and the soft porn industry. Soon after, she was contacted by the Department of Justice as part of a joint effort with the FBI. I got a call from the Department of Justice when they heard me on, on, um, on uh, the Buchanan program, and I was saying, you're, 
you're going to have to have an increase in, in sexual crimes by children against children and by adults against children. You cannot do the kind of, of programming of people's brains, minds, memories, and bodies. The connection between the brain goes all the way down from the retina all the way down the, the central nervous system and into the genitals. You, you can't show people those kinds of pictures and, and arouse them in that way and not think that they're going to act out either positively on somebody who agrees or negatively on somebody who doesn't agree. Uh, that's what's going to happen. And you can't, you just simply can't do that to billions of people at one time, uh, you know, to masses of a population. In her Department of Justice study, Dr. Reisman revealed that from 1953 to 1982, Playboy and eventually Penthouse and Hustler magazines had published approximately 9,000 images of children involved in sexual scenarios, an average of about eight to nine images per issue. And, and I showed the development of the child in those, in those images from, in cartoons, in photographs, and the use of the child as a sexual object by the observer, by the viewer. And I said, you know, your average guy thinks he's buying a girly magazine, you know, a magazine that's just pictures of pretty girls. And he has no idea that his, the messages that are being pumped into him neurophysiologically, if you will, all, you know, all the way down and through his system, include images of, of sexual assault of children. And he, as the viewer, uh, becomes the predator. That's just the way the human brain works. The following are images from Dr. Reisman's presentation at the FBI Training Center in Quantico. Please understand the most severe images we are unable to show you. Dr. Reisman demonstrates how the cartoon imagery of children progressed into real-life images, either of children or of legal-aged women who were made to look like obviously underage girls. Over time, the scenarios suggested greater degrees of sexual aggression and violence, including murder. says, can you read it? Well, anyway, it says, uh, thank you, um, good night, Betty Lou, thanks for a really swell evening. Now here, we do see the penis, one of the few cartoons that we have, the male penis. Of course, it appears that the gentleman has murdered Betty Lou. She's tied up in one of these uh, leaf bags. Now, I will challenge any of you in the next week or two weeks or month or two months or three months to drive along a road and see a garbage bag tied up like that, a leaf bag tied up like that, and not somehow to flash back to this kind of fantasy image. Now, for you, it may not be a problem, but we have reason to suspect that for some publics, that kind of continual flashback in our subconscious constitutes a real problem. Dr. Reisman believes that millions of American men have been conditioned for decades by such imagery, often struggling with an addiction that they don't understand and cannot escape. The addiction to porn has now been handed down to America's children, giving their young minds a perverse view of reality and of the relationships between men and women. With mainstream soft porn magazines having normalized the idea of sex and violence against children, could this be, as Dr. Reisman has taught, the reason for the continued rise of child abductions, child molestation, and even child murder in our country? And are these materials, which are often defended under the First Amendment, the real liberty that America's founding fathers fought and died for? I read something recently read on, uh, I think, Fox News, 
you know, um, one of the one of the, the newscasters there has got a blurb or an article right now on the internet. You know, are our children safe? Is this ever going to end? And and I know for a fact it will not end, and it is only going to get worse unless something is done about pornography. The most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence and, and sexual violence. Because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. After seeing her presentation at their training center at Quantico, the FBI ordered all copies of Playboy and Penthouse magazines to be removed from the FBI post-exchange. A similar reaction occurred with the Southland 7-Eleven Corporation, which had been a major distributor of Playboy and Penthouse. But in 1986, after seeing Dr. Reisman's presentation, the 7-Eleven chain refused to carry the publications, costing the soft porn giants untold millions in annual revenue. Dr. Reisman herself describes what the FBI and 7-Eleven were really responding to. Uh, that what they were getting in their house, what their sons were seeing, what the uncles were seeing, what the boyfriends were seeing, was how to sexually abuse a child and laugh about it. During World War II, the Nazis used cartoons to condition the minds of Germans against the Jewish people creating an exaggerated and comical identity that ultimately led to their persecution and mass murder. Dr. Reisman believes a similar kind of conditioning has happened through the use of cartoon imagery that depict the rape and abuse of children. Children are being sexually assaulted, uh, they're being, they're being uh, trampled on, they're being kidnapped, they're being murdered. And I have all of those kinds of cartoons. Some of the following cartoons are disturbing, such as this image from Playboy of an infant child masturbating with a title that reads, Getting Off. Not surprisingly, the cartoon supports the Kinseyan view that children are sexual from birth. Children are often shown to be the aggressors, as in this image of a small child speaking to an older man with a candy cane. The caption reads, no thank you nice man, I don't want to go for a ride in your car, why don't we just go up to my place and B-A-L-L. -L. This image from Penthouse has three young girls in conversation. The one with the candy cane says, yeah, and he gives you one of these just for straight sex, no deviations. This playboy image is of a young girl putting her dress back on. She says to the older man in the bathrobe, you call that being molested? In this scene, a young girl is in bed with an older man. On the phone, she says, Hello, Mommy. I met this nice political leader from the moral majority on Capitol Hill. Incest is another prominent theme of the magazines. This Playboy image shows a young girl in bed with an obviously older man. The caption reads, Everything's fine, Mama. Uncle William and I are playing a game called Consequences. This cartoon from Hustler magazine is of a father molesting his high school daughter. She says, Daddy, not only is what you're doing illegal, it's being done badly. Many scenarios involve characters that most children recognize, such as Santa Claus and the Wizard of Oz characters, in which Dorothy is either raped or molested by her companions. In this cartoon, the Santa Claus has an ecstatic look on his face because the little girl sitting on his lap has her hand inside his pants. In this one, the Santa Claus has his pants around his ankles as he rapes an obviously frightened little girl on his lap. The Santa images become especially violent, even bloody, such as this one, where the Santa character has just murdered a child with a machine gun. The child's bloody body lies on the floor. The caption reads, that'll teach you to be a good boy. There are literally thousands of such cartoons, cataloged and analyzed by Dr. Reisman. These images have been published by the soft porn industry for more than half a century. But by far the most disturbing collection comes from Larry Flint's Hustler magazine. For years, Hustler published the cartoon, Chester the Molester. It's part of a series in which this man 
was attacking children. The classic Chester cartoon is this one, where Chester sits naked in a chair with three young girls who have obviously been kidnapped, bound, and raped. The caption coming from the TV reads, It is 11 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Dr. Reisman believes that because of suggestive imagery like this, many parents don't know where their children are. Sadly, some of them will never see their children again. Chester the Molester was the invention of Hustler's head cartoonist, Dwayne Tinsley, shown here in the 1985 documentary, Rated X, where he explains the character of Chester. And Chester's the character that I do for the magazine. Um, you have this dirty old guy that would uh, do anything to trap a young girl. When you say young girl, how young do you mean? <clears throat> well, at that particular time, he was after the younger ones, 10, 12. Uh, his idea is that he wants to get all little girls. Look again carefully at this disturbing image where Chester is writing information on a notepad, almost as if he were recording data like one of Kinsey's pedophiles. First of all, if he's going to trap a little girl, you know, the idea for him would be to, to knock her out or something. I don't know. I mean, he didn't have to uh, uh, actually use a club or a bat. He could have smacked her. But just the idea of, uh, of the bat is a little goofier. Uh, what better than a baseball bat? I mean, it was just always with him. He was going to uh, hit the little girl over the head with a trap or hit the little girl with his club and drag her off to his lair, as it were. Whether she was going to have fun or not, it was never established. This same attitude seems to have carried into Tinsley's own life. Four years after appearing in this documentary, Tinsley's daughter would testify in court that she had been repeatedly raped by Tinsley himself. In 1989, Dwayne Tinsley was tried and convicted as a child rapist, in part because of the research on his work done by Dr. Reisman. There's just no question at all that those cartoons that we showed, that they showed the, the jury, were absolute evidence of the crimes he had committed on his daughter as testified by his daughter. During the trial, the jury was shown one of Tinsley's cartoons, which depicted a father molesting his teenage daughter. The caption reads, Gee, I'd love to go to the drive-in, Tommy, but my dad has some, uh, extra household chores for me tonight. In court, Tinsley's daughter claimed that her father showed her this cartoon and said to her, This is you and me. The Associated Press reported that Tinsley often said, you can't write this stuff all the time if you don't experience it. There's no normal human being that can draw those things, that can put that kind of idea out there to the public who is not experiencing that themselves. No, it's just not going to happen. But Tinsley was not alone. His employer, Larry Flint, was also accused by his daughter, Tanya Flint Vega, in her book, Hustled in which she claimed that her father used the Chester the Molester cartoons to introduce her to the idea of sex and then raped her when she was only nine years old. Like many pedophiles, Larry Flint was never charged with a crime and openly denied his daughter's allegations. Even Hugh Hefner is said to have been guilty of statutory rape. According to biographer Russell Miller in his book, Bunny, The Real Story of Playboy, Hefner himself enjoyed making love to a schoolgirl who had attended his daughter's Sweet 16 birthday party. Miller's evidence was based on the testimony of the staff that worked in the Playboy Mansion at the time. As with Larry Flint, Hefner was never charged with a crime. A major breakthrough for Hefner's Playboy magazine and child pornographers in general was the film Pretty Baby, starring Brooke Shields a film briefly remembered during the recent controversy over the images of 15-year-old Miley Cyrus. Pretty Baby was the story of a 12-year-old girl who grows up with a prostitute mother and ends up losing her virginity in a whorehouse. 
People magazine ran a story saying Brooke Shields 12 stirs a furor over child porn in films. Playboy featured images from the film along with an interview with the film's director Louis Mal. In the interview Mal said when Playboy requested a photo that would express my personal vision of eroticism I sent a shot of my two-year-old daughter Justine naked. This led to the photos above of Brooke Shields, whom I cast in the title role of my new film, Pretty Baby. As early as 1971, Reader's Digest published an article titled, What Sex Offenders Say About Pornography. The article cited the FBI's Uniform Crime Reports, stating that between 1960 and 1969, the number of forcible rapes committed by males under 18 had increased by 86 percent. It could be concluded that some force impelling towards sex crime has been operating on younger males in the United States. The period described by the FBI was one in which Playboy magazine had been the principal form of widespread pornography in America, especially the kind that would find its way into the hands of underage males. Then in the 1980s, the Surgeon General C. Everett Koop called pornography a clear and present danger to American public health. And who could forget the disturbing warning given by serial killer Ted Bundy in his final interview with Dr. James Dobson just hours before his execution in 1989. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. Despite these warnings, the so-called soft porn industry has been normalized in America, partly because some of the most powerful social and political leaders of the last half century have given interviews and appeared in these magazines, helping to make them part of America's mainstream. Perhaps most famous was Jimmy Carter's Playboy interview in 1976 as a presidential candidate. While ultimately considered a political blunder, it undoubtedly sent a message of acceptability to the up-and-coming generation, to those who, in time, would end up running the country. As such, what sort of decisions would they make on behalf of America's women and children? It is also important to consider that the warnings from Ted Bundy and the Surgeon General were given years before the widespread use of the Internet, where today, pornography is available to the masses like never before in history. The Internet, I'm not trying to say, is a real negative and dark thing. There's a lot of positive and good things coming out of the Internet, but people need to be aware of the dark element that the Internet pr provides to people. And it's in a very private, um, uh, secret place, so people can keep their can be anonymous. Whereas, you know, 20, 30 years ago, to go to a porn shop, you know, you'd have to go to a seedy part of town and, and, and you know, people would recognize you. It's not that way anymore. It comes right into your house. And that's why I think it's so dangerous. Uh, the idea that pornography doesn't really hurt anyone is a fallacious argument. How many marriages, how many Tens of thousands, perhaps millions of people are hurting in their relationships because of pornography. And the guy who watches porn is basically probably going to get addicted to the porn. And if he does ever get married, sex is never going to be right because he's going to be so obsessed with the pornography that's not even real anyways. I believe that God intended sex to be between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Can you explain the images on the computer? This is nothing right here. You know, just because you're not out with some other woman doesn't mean that you're not being unfaithful to our marriage. And what else do you need? What do you need? I want my husband provide? to be faithful. 
I want my husband to be a father to his children. I don't want him in his office watching pornography and telling me that he's trying to meet deadlines. It's said that the greatest myth about pornography is that nobody gets hurt. Some even argue that porn is a healthy outlet for men and women alike. But has this really proven to be the case? Or does an addiction to porn create a kind of shadow person, someone who ends up leading a double life, one that the rest of those in his world can only wonder about? And when his dark secrets are finally brought into the light, what will be revealed? One who understands the dark temptations of pornography is former penthouse producer Jay Gator Henry, who claims he narrowly escaped a lifestyle that became so extreme it almost landed him in prison. I'll say that, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I when I see these men that are being arrested on the news. As a former producer for Penthouse Magazine, Gator rubbed elbows with some of the big celebrities in Hollywood, including Ozzy Osbourne and Pamela Anderson. And as you would expect, his work exposed him to countless penthouse models. Man, it was an ego rush to be around the most beautiful women in the world and, and then running around naked. And, and to a lot of men in America, you know, I had the dream job. I mean, I was their hero. I was doing what everybody thought was the greatest thing in the world to, that a man could be doing for a profession. Gator believes his addiction to pornography began with a troubled childhood. My, uh, my uncle had molested me when I was a child. And... Um, he ended up confessing that to me uh, prior to his death from uh, from AIDS uh, uh, some year, a few years ago, and and uh, I so I had that event in my life, and then I also remember when I was young finding a, a penthouse in my father's bedroom closet, and boy, I thought that was the greatest thing since sliced bread when I found that thing, and uh, you know when you're at that age and everything else, and uh, so I, I immediately was was hooked on the whole thing, so it was kind of interesting that everything turned around and ended up working for penthouse and pornography especially printed pornography people think of penthouse or playboy or whatever is is is, is innocent um, and i'm here to say that it, it's it's absolutely not um, having also a drug past myself marijuana as marijuana is a stepping stone in the drug world penthouse magazine or playboy magazine is a stepping stone in the porn world you start there it's not going to end there Gator claims that the steps on his journey through pornography led him into deeper and darker levels of perversion. Eventually, he found himself on the brink of criminal behavior. It, it got so bad where I would get on the internet. Again, I was just consumed. The ages of the girls I was looking at, in order for me to get the rush and, and to get that tingle, that, that buzz that I wanted to get from the sexual side of it, what happens is you start looking at younger and younger images, younger and younger pictures of girls. And what happened for me one day was it, the thought just slammed me that I probably have done things and probably had images on my computer at that time that could put me in prison. I look at these men who abduct these young girls and they molest them and, and kill them, bury them alive or whatever they do, stab them multiple times and stuff. And, and I know that those men, like me, they didn't wake up, they didn't start off, they didn't grow up as a little boy saying, oh, my ambition in life is grow up to be a child molester and killer. And I know for a fact that all of, everything in the marrow of my bones, because I've been there, I've walked and lived it, that pornography took them to that place where just your average Joe comes to a place in his mind and in his being where he's so consumed with that fulfillment of that lustful thought and pleasure, with that thought that he has to fulfill it. And the fantasy becomes so overpowering and so all-consuming. And those are the guys that go out and take these girls.
Thankfully, Gator Henry says that in his case, he never reached that point of criminal behavior. Today, he tells others he found strength to turn away from his dark addiction through his faith in God. I remember it now and I saw myself. How wretched I really was before him and, and how I had sinned against him and he'd been so merciful to me. Dr. Judith Reisman has commented that in her more than 30 years of research, she has seen few, if any, escape their porn addiction except through anti-porn activism or faith-based programs. In Gator Henry's case, he says it was his Christian faith and the teachings he found in the Bible that kept him from becoming a sex offender. And what, what delivered me, what took me out of that, was plain and simple. Nothing but the power of Jesus Christ and the power of His Spirit through the fear of God. That fear might be summed up in the Gospel of Luke when speaking about children Jesus said, It were better for a man that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. In 1994, an underground film was released titled Chicken Hawk, Men Who Love Boys. The film documented the lives of certain members of NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. The word chicken hawk is a reference in the gay community to older men who prey upon underage children, boys in particular. I have um, all my life been attracted to younger boys. Where are the boys? Boys are everywhere. You don't have, there's no one single place. There's the, the mall, the supermarket, the street, the sports event. I can look out my window and see the school. and <laughs> It's like uh, Moses uh, looking across to the promised land. He kept uh, making excuses to pull up his shirt and show me his belly in a highly flirtatious way to any ordinary boy lover such as myself, uh, a very exciting and appealing way. Now, the Queen's vernacular is con was considered to be the number one uh, gay lexicon dictionary for, for homosexual language. 12,000 words in this, in this dictionary. And you open it up, and uh, the, their, um, their mascot is, as was the mascot in The Advocate, a boy, a uh, boy scout in this case. And uh, the, the, the 12,000 words that are in here uh, all relate to the in, the, the, the in language, the, what, the cant that's being used within the, within the homosexual movement uh, amongst homosexuals. Uh, what do all these words mean? Well, they had a certain meaning for the homosexual world that, that the straight world didn't understand. It was it's another language. Very interesting because, you know, 12,000 words, well, when Webster compiled his American Dictionary to distinguish us from the English, that had 12,000 new words as well. So that we were distinct from, from the English, from, from Samuel Johnson's dictionary. Uh, Webster said, no, we're a unique people. He had 12,000 words to show that. So this dictionary says, we are unique people. We have 12,000 words to show that. And some of those words we compiled in, in uh, we did an analysis of these words. And um, we found that the number one quoted word, the, the, or in order of importance, was a chicken, which relates to boys. Chicken a young recruit, any boy under the age of consent, heterosexual, fair of face, and unfamiliar with homosexuality. There are 254 words there that deal with sex with boys. One of the most disturbing sequences in the film Chicken Hawk were a series of interviews done with parents whose children were being openly preyed upon in a small community by this pedophile, a man named Leland Stevenson. He is shown openly preying upon underage children, looking for an opportunity 
to molest them. So what happened? What? You made the phone ring. Oh, you made the phone ring. Oh, well, let's see how you did that. Oh, jeez. You're just tired to No, you can get trouble for me. He was so eager to tell me when his birthday was, and he was going to be 15 in less than a month on the 1st of December. And uh, this is what life is about. This is what real life is about. I would say that he was in bloom, and that's it. The flower is uh, responding to warmth. That is, I as a human being am bathing him in a certain kind of celestial warmth. The frustration of the parents interviewed in this film is not unlike that of parents across America who live in fear of seeing their children violated by sexual predators. I'd probably kill him. Honest, I probably would if he would have bothered my kids. You know, they prey on these children and how they can stand up and tell people what they believe in and that there's nothing that you can do about it. I don't understand our judicial system, that's for sure. Chicken Hawk, Men Who Love Boys, stands as a powerful indicator of the damage done to America in its post-Kinsey era. We remind the audience that the group NAMBLA, who are the focus of this film, claim to take their inspiration directly from Alfred Kinsey. And while many in the gay community would deny that homosexuality is linked to pedophilia, it is worth noting that the very founder of the gay rights revolution, Harry Hay, consistently advocated the inclusion of NAMBLA in gay pride parades. In fact, here is a photo of Hay marching in a parade with the words, NAMBLA walks with me, written on his back. Needless to say, Hay had been persuaded by his chief influence, Alfred Kinsey. Like Kinsey, many pedophiles refuse to acknowledge that their sexual involvement with children qualifies as child molestation. Kinsey said some of the most brilliant things imaginable about that. Uh, pedophilia is an almost non-existent um, uh, kind of crime, and the thing that he hated most about it is that people use words like uh, child molestation. What is that? Nobody knows. Um, <laughs> the, uh, abuse of children? Are they talking about bollocks them against the ear or hitting them with a stovepipe? Are they talking about uh, tickling them a little? Uh, are you talking about fondling? You're going to put fondling and death attacks in the same group? As Kinsey said, by this kind of paranoia, you do the child more damage for life than all the pedophiles in the world would do. Is it true that a vast majority of homosexual men admit to having engaged in pedophilia at some point? Oh, yeah, surely. There's a vast majority of, of homosexual males are on record within the, within the homosexual literature itself. Even the advocate admitted to at minimum 21% and we had up to 70-some percent by other uh, homosexual publications and researchers. And one of them, you know, one of the research publications came out of the Kinsey Institute. And we have this high rate of AIDS amongst young men who've been infected as boys, which means that they were basically being sexually assaulted. This is what I consider mass murder when you're talking about thousands of boys who have been molested by men who end up with AIDS. And we have a statement by one of the, in, in the advocate, by one of the uh, leaders in the homosexual movement who says, uh, these boys are being used as sex toys, he says. By, he says, I know that, by many homosexual males. He says, they don't seem to think it matters. It doesn't matter to them. Uh, because they're perceiving of these boys as sexual toys and they're assuming that the boys, quote, like it. Well, it's back the same old business of she says no, 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 but she really means yes, 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 but it's applied to young boys. While groups like NAMBLA seem to represent an extreme viewpoint, the reality is that their philosophy is embraced by leading members of the academic community in what is called sexology, the study of human sexuality. From the late 60s and early 70s, both in the US and in the UK, 
there was what's called a paedophile liberation movement. And this put the notion, put forward the notion very vo volubly that it's perfectly all right for men to have, or well, indeed women, for adults to have, quotes, consensual sexual relationships with children of any age, which is plainly nonsense. But the pedophile liberation movement is still at work in America's academic institutions and includes men who design the thinking behind what is taught in America's sex education programs. You roll it down the penis, and that protects the man when his penis is inside the woman's vagina. There was never any science in all this. There's, it's got nothing to do with science. It's always been political. It's always been one people's own sexual perversions that have driven them. And now that drives those sexual perversions into the schoolroom in the form of sexual sex education curricula. Some of the leading pedophile supporters include the late Dr. John Money of John Hopkins University, Dr. John DiCecco, Professor Gilbert Hurt, and Dr. Hubert Kennedy, all out of San Francisco University. Perhaps the most influential was the late Dr. Vern Bulla from the Center for Sex Research at California State University, Northridge. Each of these men have either been editors for or have appeared in the Netherlands publication, Pydeca, the Journal of Pedophilia, a pseudo-academic journal specifically dedicated to normalizing and ultimately legalizing child molestation in society. Also appearing in Pydeca was Dr. Ralph Underwager, who was often called as an expert witness in court cases involving child abuse. In his 1991 interview with Pydeca, Underwager stated that pedophiles can boldly and courageously affirm what they choose. They can say that what they want is to find the best way to love, an acceptable expression of God's will for love and unity. It may take people being arrested. Revolutionaries have always risked arrest. As alarming as this is, during our investigation, we were surprised at the number of people who seemed to accept the pedophile philosophy. And how do you feel about the issue of child pornography? I kind of think that uh, it probably doesn't make sense in the same way that nothing else makes sense, but unlike a lot of people who just have this visceral reaction to it, I kind of feel like if people are having sex and if they just want to do it you know, openly, uh, it really shouldn't make a difference what age people are. It's our strict laws that result in uh, so many of these kids being killed by child molesters because they're so afraid of what would happen to them if they get caught. It's a direct result of our stringent laws. I mean, uh, I think uh, everybody's got to be broken in somehow, you know, and ever since the dawn of man, it's been a normal thing where uh, people, when they're young and don't know anything, get broken in by somebody. If they're old enough to bleed, it's all good, <laughs> as far as women are concerned. Today, the two leading institutes that promote pedophilia are the Kinsey Institute in Bloomington, Indiana, which receives more than $700,000 a year in taxpayer funding. And in San Francisco, the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality, a private institution founded by Kinsey's homosexual lover and co-author Wardell B. Pomeroy. Despite its storefront appearance, the Institute is said to be the Harvard University for all human sexuality training. This Institute creates the PhDs, the master's degree people, the teachers, the, the, the bachelor's degrees, the safe sex educators, and a whole variety of other AIDS prevention people that go into the schoolrooms all over the country and teach children about homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, bestiality, condoms, and all the rest of it, teach sex. In all cases, these are people who are Kinsian trained. On their official website, the Institute states that there need to be sociosexual activities available to those disadvantaged because of age. Some believe this is a veiled reference to children and that the Institute calls them disadvantaged because it's illegal for them to engage in sex. Can this really be the case? 
we decided to pay a visit to the Institute and question them about this and some other information on their website. Even if it's two minutes, the no, pain, no, I, I really can't. No, Can you answer uh, one question for us, sir? Needless to say, our initial attempts were met with resistance. There's, there's, can we get just one answer? On your website, which you make public, you say that you help those who are disadvantaged because they're aged sexually. Does that add up to endorsing pedophilia? We do not endorse anything up there. I would strongly that. recommend that you turn the camera off and leave right now. This is, this private, is private property. property. Get out. Despite what appears to have been a denial, the Institute's website declares it is the sexual right of all people to engage in sexual acts or activities of any kind whatsoever, and that people have the right to sexual entertainment, including sexually explicit materials dealing with the full range of sexual behavior. If taken literally, these so-called rights would obviously include pedophilia and child pornography. Beyond all this, the Institute's founding director, Wardell Pomeroy, wrote the book, Boys and Sex, in which he promoted the idea of boys having sex with animals, such as a dog, a horse, or a bull. Pomeroy also stated that incest between adults and younger children can prove to be a satisfying and enriching experience. But the influence of Pomeroy's Sex Institute goes even beyond the academic community and into America's churches. The line from Kinsey to the current destruction of the Catholic Church is very direct. In the past four years, more than 180 people have come forward claiming they were sexually abused by priests in this area over the past 60 years. Consider this raw data. A survey commissioned by the U.S. Catholic Church found more than 10,000 allegations of sexual abuse involving more than 4,300 priests and deacons. The harm done to trusting families is immeasurable and was perhaps most powerfully captured by filmmaker Amy Berg in Deliver Us From Evil, a documentary about a child molesting priest and the anguish he brought to countless children and their parents. I feel betrayed by the church. The church had betrayed me and my family. And they destroyed it. When the uh, Vatican II uh, comes through and the whole notion of liberalizing the church emerges, this group of sexologists or, sex, or psychologists who are trained by them go into the uh, to the clergy goes goes into the Catholic Church to help decide who makes a good priest. They throw out all the Orthodox applicants and people who kind of are unsure or or who are very sure who are rather homosexual or something. They get put through, and the the folks who are not quite quite as stable in in a way in terms of their Orthodoxy. They're permitted into the clergy to a great extent. And several of our key um, dioceses or, or the training, the places where, where the clergy are trained, bring in pornography from the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality to train priests the same way the medical profession has been trained. Desensitizing the, the priests on issues of homosexuality and promiscuity and bisexuality and everything else, using that pornography to desensitize them and condition them, and in many cases, to seduce them. But the fallout has extended into mainstream Protestant churches as well, with one scandal after another, involving some of America's top evangelical leaders. I have sinned against you, my Lord. Uh, it just is a tragedy of the first order. You know, I could give you a theological reason, Nancy. Um, I think the enemy of our souls, Satan, assaults the church and assaults the truth. As with Roman Catholicism, Protestant sex scandals all over the country often involve pedophile pastors and church leaders preying upon young children. 
While the hypocrisy involved is undeniable, can it be that this is the unavoidable conclusion of Kinsey's sexual revolution? A society so overwhelmed with temptation that even the most would-be pious members find it all but impossible to resist. And what will this mean for churches in America? There's a whole issue of denial. We have turned our back on understanding that this is a significant, profound problem in the church. And I think that there needs to be an awareness and education, and I think that pastors need to address it from the pulpit. Jeff Reinke is the marriage and family pastor of North Coast Calvary Chapel in Carlsbad, California. He believes that what we currently know about men struggling with sexual addiction in American churches is far worse than many Christian leaders are willing to admit. I am grieved uh, at the, the lack of moral outrage uh, that, uh, that there is lacking today in our culture and particularly in the church in the whole area of sexual perversion. Uh, I, I believe it is the Mount Whitney. I think addiction, in particular sexual addiction, is the Mount Whitney of the sin in the church today. If I could use a more effective metaphor, I really think it's like an iceberg, is we just barely see the tip of it. Uh, but underneath the surface, there is such deep denial, and, and that denial is led to personal destruction, I, th I think particularly with men. This is nothing, right? This is nothing. Don't mean anything. This is nothing. I mean, I'm looking at a few pictures. Would you rather I'm actually with another girl? Like a, a pro, I mean, would you, did I actually cheat on you? You know, actually, I would prefer that my husband not do either one. Are you trying to give me an option? It's either a prostitute or the computer? There's not a week that goes by in my own counseling practice that I am not counseling a couple, that I don't get a phone call or an email in regards to sexual addiction. I had a, a wife whose husband is a lawyer in, in the area, and she's filing for divorce. For the last six years, he's been caught in prostitution, uh, in pornography, in, uh, in strip, in strip tease uh, centers and so forth. And she asked me this question. She said, how is it that he could call himself a Christian for the last five years, that he's been struggling with this, with this stuff? How can he call himself a Christian? Could you tell me that, Pastor? When is it going to stop with you? I'm not covering for you anymore. Dude, what's there to cover? There's nothing wrong with this. Did you look at it? There's nothing wrong yeah, with this. Yeah, I did look at it, and the... so did your son. Yes? So what? What kind of a father have you become? You're gonna, you... Now you're going to talk about me being a father? It's going to stop, and it's going to stop now. It already stopped. That's what you said months ago. What kind of marriage is this? You know, it's, not, it's one thing that you make me feel like I'm not even your wife, that I'm worth nothing, that you have to look at magazines and porn. What do you expect from me? I can't even look at you anymore. How do I explain this to your children? You know, you've got a problem, and now you've made it ours. Fix it. With so much devastation affecting America at many levels, the question is, why hasn't something been done about Kinsey's dark legacy? The answers are complicated. Many brush off the continued influence of Kinsey and his disciples because they are told that things have gotten better because of them. It is often reported that sex crimes are diminishing in America and that rape has supposedly declined by 85% since 1970. Law professor Anthony Diamato published an essay in 2006 titled Porn Up, Rape Down, 
crediting the porn industry for this so-called reduction of rape. But leading members of law enforcement strongly disagree. Denver Police Lieutenant James D. Ponzi is a Regis University professor whose research on crime statistics has been presented at Harvard University and published in police journals across the country. Ponzi was quoted in Police Beat in May of 2005. He said, in 1998, Shannon Scheiber was raped and murdered. The lawsuit her parents filed revealed the practice of downgrading sexual crimes. Departments cooked the books to lower crime rates. Lieutenant Ponzi got emails from different departments all over the country regarding statistics being altered in their cities. Ponzi said these lower rape statistics don't reflect what is truly happening in sex-related crimes. The reason for the deception is political pressure to lower crime rates, as partly exposed by U.S. News and World Report. In April of 2000, they wrote, Facing political heat to cut crime in the city, investigators in the New York Sex Crime Unit sat on thousands of reports of rapes and other sexual assaults. Police Captain Rich Costello stated that the way crime was solved was with an eraser. In that same year, it was also reported that the FBI conducted a limited investigation and discovered that PPD had failed to report between 13,000 and 37,000 major crimes. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman is a West Point psychology professor and Pulitzer Prize nominee. He is a renowned expert in human aggression and co-author of the book, Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill. On crime statistics, he says, the downturn in violent crime in the U.S. in the 1990s is very deceptive. Violent crime is still about five times greater today per capita than it was in 1957. Grossman says the biggest factor for the lower crime rates is that we are lying about the data. One of the tactics used is to manipulate statistics in a way that gives a false impression to the public. For example, at the beginning of this film, we told you that some 58,200 children are abducted each year by non-family members. This report from the Department of Justice goes on to say that only 115 of these are stereotypical kidnappings. But they define stereotypical kidnapping to include children who are held for ransom or transported a distance of 50 or more miles. The report goes on to say that of the 58,200 children abducted, about half of the victims were sexually assaulted. While most people will be left thinking only about 115 kids, the reality is that at least 29,000 children are kidnapped and raped in America each year. The report also says that this is an underestimate. Researchers like Lieutenant James Ponzi, who we spoke with during our investigation, believe that the real number is much higher than anyone is able to document. As parents and guardians, we should consider again carefully the words of former prosecutor Ann Bremner. And we also see in a lot of these kidnapping and death cases recently by sex offenders that your child can be lost in just an instant. So I think you have to be vigilant at all times. Be vigilant at all times. Manipulation of truth and political pressure have continued to protect the influence of Alfred Kinsey and his followers for more than half a century. In the 1980s, the Reagan administration developed a commission to investigate the influence of pornography. The Department of Justice brought in Dr. Judith Reisman, who initially wanted to investigate Kinsey along with the images in Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler. But just as the Reese Committee was opposed in the 1950s, so Dr. Reisman was shot down in the 1980s. She conducted her research at American University, but once she began, the university vehemently opposed any investigation into Kinsey, and she was forced to drop it. I said, I'm not doing anything with human subjects. I'm just going to be clean, you know, researching his work, the things that he's already written. 
And they said, no, 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 you can't do that. So academic freedom was completely uh, eliminated because the Kinsey Institute had some kind of power structure going there that caused them to be unable to, uh, to allow me to pursue a just United States Department of Justice grant from, your from our country that, that would have allowed me, as an objective researcher, to look into the Kinsey research as it stood. The president of American University at the time was Dr. Richard Berenson, who was later exposed in a sex scandal involving a series of obscene phone calls in which Berenson claimed he had a four-year-old girl that he kept as a sex slave down in his basement. The calls were eventually traced to his office at American University. Berenson was exposed as a pedophile. And I spoke with a lawyer later and it turned out, of course, he had pornography in his drawers. They cleaned out the office, got rid of the pornography, though we found out, they found out later, the lawyer did, that it was, had been there. And he quickly fled, ran to Johns Hopkins University and entered there and uh, stayed there for, I think it was three weeks and got a, uh, a clean bill of health from, uh, from Johns Hopkins saying you that... like psychiatric treatment? Yes. Yes, suddenly he was okay. But political opposition came not only from American University, but also in Washington, D.C., over the analysis of Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler. As a result, Dr. Reisman was forced to publish her report independently. The FBI and 7-Eleven took notice, as we mentioned earlier, and that's when the soft porn giants fought back. In her book, The Powerhouse, journalist Susan B. Trento documents how Playboy and Penthouse magazines hired a Washington-based PR firm named Gray & Company to create a media blitz that would discredit Dr. Reisman and the entire Reagan Commission on Pornography. She writes that dealing with Judith Reisman was not difficult. Since Reisman was without political savvy and lacked allies, she made a most appealing target for discrediting. Trento says that Gray and Company charged between $50,000 and $75,000 per month for the campaign against Dr. Reisman, and that for this particular account, much of the cost was borne by Playboy. Penthouse also provided funding. Because of the controversy, it would be a decade later before Dr. Reisman's research would be officially embraced by the Department of Justice. In a letter written by past administrator Robert Sweet, he says, while the massive affluent sex industry has employed nearly every technique in their arsenal short of violence to stop Dr. Reisman's work, they have not shown her findings to be incorrect or methodologically flawed in even the smallest detail. Why don't yeah, you, you care more about the children than you do uh, about protecting the finances of the sex industry and the sex establishment? Yes, Judah. Right, the sex industry. <laughs> so, tell me about this sex industry. Dr. Reisman has for years argued against the harmful impact of the sex industry on America's children. Many of the PhDs who teach in our universities have not only been associated with the Journal of Pedophilia, but have also served as the board members for pornographic magazines like Penthouse Forum. These are the people who have designed the programs for sex education in America. Because Kinsey chose to define the pain and suffering of abused children as orgasm, he then argued that children were sexual from birth and should be taught about having sex as soon as possible. While most who promote the programs probably don't know it, this thinking is what lies behind the idea of teaching sex education to kindergartners. I remember him uh, using this in, a camp in his campaign against me, saying Barack Obama supports uh, teaching sex education to kindergartners. And, you know, which I didn't know what to tell him. Um, <laughs> but, but it's the right thing to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to provide age-appropriate um, sex education, science-based sex education, science-based sex education in the schools. 
Remember that this science-based sex education begins with the so-called scientific data gathered by Kinsey's pedophiles and recorded by him in his sex reports. Something that Kinsey's followers continue to insist is relevant in teaching our children today. These specific findings about these children are totally irrelevant to modern sex education. Consider again this image of a teacher showing what appears to be six and seven-year-old girls how to use a condom. Who will this seven-year-old be using a condom with? When you consider that the PhDs who have designed these programs openly support the pedophile philosophy, we can only wonder, is sex education really intended to protect America's children or to condition them for seduction at the hands of a child molester? Why are America's children disappearing? For those who study the influence of Alfred Kinsey, the answer becomes more than clear. The Kinsey Institute continues to lead the way in sex education and continues to be funded by the American taxpayer. Dr. Reisman believes the Institute should come under an official investigation, something she was prevented from doing during her time at the Department of Justice. The Kinsey Institute was so frightened that the truth would come out. Uh, that time it was Rhinish and then later it would be Bancroft, that they, they threatened lawsuits to everybody and they pulled out every stop. They put the arm on everyone politically and in, in institutionally, their Rockefeller grants, their money, their funding from all kinds of other people would put, be pulled into play to stop Reisman from looking at the information that was right out there that belongs in the, in the hands of the American public so that the American public can make their own decisions about whether this is true, whether I'm wrong and, and I should be uh, sued or put in jail or something, fine. Or whether they're wrong and we need to have a proper investigation so that the American public knows the truth about our history and how come we're getting to where we are, we are where we are, in terms of uh, the kinds of violence that are taking place in society and violence to children. We are told that our founding fathers went to war so that America might be free. But how they would respond, we can only wonder if they could see our country today and witness how we now define that original liberty for which brave men fought and died.